Last one, we met Michael Bonner, a teacher from North Carolina. Here's a quick recap. My name is Michael Bonner, and I'm the second grade teacher here in South Carolina. I'm the teacher here that they have a home and is hungry. It's a different bar. And when it shows up in the classroom, you have to find a way to continually fight and persevere. Music is something that always gets me going. So I decided to hey, I'll probably make a song about the standard.
find out more about South Greenville Elementary, you can log on to our website. We'll be right back. I have one other comment to make, and, and I was sharing this with, with Amy when we were, uh, we were driving up, because this is a, a, a quote from Frederick Douglass that I understand is, is one of Michael's favorite quotes. And, and this touched both of us tremendously. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And with that, I give you Michael Bonner. I'm going to help him out by closing out the tabs for you. <laughs> no problem. Oh, we got action. How y'all doing today? Good. This is so good to be here. I do not like standing behind the podium. I'm a teacher. I like to move. I like to get around and actually interact with people. So please forgive me if I'm not the, the standard here, OK? Uh, first thing, thank you so much for inviting me here to Coastal Carolina. This is an amazing university. Like, it looks almost like a ballroom to a house. Like, I was telling how beautiful it is, how amazing and generous the people are. Amanda has been a phenomenal, phenomenal individual. She's been texting me and checking on me, hey, you're coming. I left. <laughs> Of course I'm coming, I left immediately after teaching today, and today was a day, y'all. My kids, Ooh. I literally saw them turn into grillings and minions right in front of my eyes. <laughs> like, what's happening? Like, wait a minute, chill out. And they were just all over the place today. So at 2.30, I hopped in the car. I drove the car about 80, 85. They asked me to fly, definitely was flying uh, down here just to be with you all. And, and it's such an honor and, and pleasure to be here today. I'm going to move this awkward microphone out of the way. Very awkward. Um, on your program, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it says it, but the presentation that I'm going to do today is called The Road to Bonneville, and it's motivation leads to innovation. As my amazing friend here said, the profession of education is currently taking a hit. I don't think you know, but it is very easy to be a mediocre teacher in the classroom. You can put on a YouTube video, have the kids do indoor recess all day, you sit back and scroll on Instagram, okay? It happens, y'all like, oh my gosh, is it true? It happens. So, with this slide here, I want to walk you through the road, Bonnie. I want you to hop in the car with me. I want you to follow me along as we get to our destination. I want you to understand how this guy from a small country town uh, get to be with Ellen DeGeneres on the show. That was actually my first time going there, which was an amazing experience. They actually <coughs> surprised me. They said, hey, we want to fly you out. We want you to be, they said, we want to interview your kids. We want to fly you out. I said, thank you for being when I teach a web series. When I arrived, that's how they surprised me. That's where that picture came from. The second one, uh, she called my kids back. And we actually made a real music video with Big Sean to our original song and Ice Cube and Migos. And it, it was an amazing experience. I took my 20 of my kids with seven chaperones. We were able to go there and get on the Hollywood set. And they had the chance to go into the Universal Studios. Everything <coughs> covered, everything paid for. And we're going to definitely get into that more. But people often see the picture, but they don't understand the toll that it takes us out of education. Teaching is the greatest profession in the world's hands down. I don't care what anybody says. Every profession leads back to being a teacher. But what people do not understand is <coughs> there's a certain type of grind that happens inside of teaching that it wears on you emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally. Or you know it, you can be so sick and tired of teaching, you're just sitting there and just don't even want to be at work anymore. And I want to make sure I highlight that process because it, that is an important, critical exit on the road to Bonneville, I was talking here with the teachers here, and you can sort of hear the underlying tone how hard we work every single day just so, just so we can make sure that we produce excellence inside of the classroom. <coughs> so I'm going to tell you how did I get here. Y'all see this gif? You can see it on the TV. <laughs> this is from the movie Bad Teacher. Raise your hand if you seen Bad Teacher before. Yeah. <coughs> now, not the movie, y'all. This part is what I want to highlight. This was me three years ago. Let me tell you a little, walk in a little story, I'm going to clip that scene before I get like, so distracted by the shit. <laughs> I teach at South River Elementary. 
100% free and reduced lunch, which means that at least uh, you have to have make, you have to be making less than sixteen thousand dollars a year to qualify for free and reduced lunch. The last time I checked, don't don't hold me to it. The last time I checked, and that's our school the entire way. So if you can imagine, if you looked at Eric Jensen's book or Teaching with Poverty in Mind or Study Poverty, you recognize there are certain psychological factors that play inside of a child's cognitive perspective that helps them react differently than a normal child. Would. <coughs> when they go inside of a classroom, they can't. They don't respond as they should. Instead of saying, hey, excuse me, could you give me that? Hey, excuse me, give me that. That's how they talk. So what ended up happening is at my school, we want to name this guy Mr. Grumpy because Mr. Grumpy is going to be able to protect his confidentiality. Ironically, he just texted me. He's in third grade at another school. It's awards day. I'm excited. My baby's about to get some reading awards. They've been working hard inside. got to read. I'm like, yeah, babies. You do it. You go across stage. I'm going to check me. I got you. Mr. Grumpy decides that he wants to get mad because he doesn't get an award. So I'm like, okay, Mr. Grumpy, it's fine. We all get our feelings sometimes. We're adults. You know, sometimes we don't win. We're like, man, okay, next time. No, Mr. Grumpy <coughs> takes it to another level, and Mr. Grumpy takes a chair and swings across the classroom. Woo! And he was like, yeah, I'll get the chair at you. I'm sick and tired of this. You can shut up and do that. I'm like, you are this tall boy. You are not taller than me. You are not disrespect me like this. And he kept on going to the point I had to ask my teacher assistant, hey, could you just walk the kids to the wardrobe? All right, I want to get him situated and calm. He did not want to calm down. This guy began to swing and actually kick me on my shin. I said, oh, he really doesn't mess up. <laughs> Step on your <laughs> that was my thought. I didn't act on it. <laughs> but he still didn't calm down. And I have 20 babies ready to go, and they're watching this. I'm like, this isn't normal. This isn't education. So then my teacher sister walked down. I called the mom. I said, hey, your son is true. I need you to get here now. Fix the situation. Baby, hit me one more time. I'm forget that he's seven years old. <laughs> I'm glad you're home. Okay? I said, let's go, son, to the office. Mr. Grumpy said no, and he sat there like that and refused to move. I said, Lord Jesus, I'm gonna have to pick him up. I don't want to do it. Because if I left him there, I'm liable for him. He can tear the whole classroom up, I'm gonna have to clean it up. I picked this kid up, he fights the whole entire way. It wasn't the issue of can I carry him? It's the fact that I have to carry the kid. And I remember at the end of the day, I went to Washington, DC. And on my ride on that train to Washington, DC, I said, man. I can't stand my job. That's how I was. At that point in time, I hated teaching. <coughs> February 2016. I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision. If I really wanted to be a great educator, if I wanted to last in this profession of teaching, which we all know is an amazing career but can be extremely tough, I have to change something. I have to change something. So I'm going to tell you the three things that I did as a teacher that helped me get to where I'm at today. Three simple things. Please, this is so true. And when you become a teacher, they cancel on Monday meetings after you've been teaching all day and you out of <laughs> And it's fun for a moment, right? But what ends up happening is those meetings sometimes are beneficial. Please look in my head. It says, make reflection a daily practice. I know you talk about this out of your education classrooms, about reflecting on your day and your teaching strategies. So what I decided to do at that low point as a teacher, I said, let me go back and reflect. This is a picture of the data of my school. You know, it's no moving chips, so you can actually check it out behind your table. And I want you to get a good look at it because data is extremely important. Every decision that you do should be driven by data. And we're completely honest with experience with data every day. Say perhaps there was this fine young lady in here and I went and got a number and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? We exchange numbers and I text her and she doesn't respond. Okay, maybe, maybe something's wrong. But if I text her two times and she does respond, that data is an indicator, brother, she's not feeling you. <laughs> We interact with data every single day. So on the board, on this, uh, this amazing projector on the TVs around you, this is the test scores um, from math and the proficiency <coughs> percentage. As you can see, South River Elementary, 32.4%. 
The state of North Carolina is at an average of 62.3%, and if you look at the bottom four schools in the surrounding areas of Pitt County, 81% at Wintergreen, 67% at Chicago, 67 at Ridgewood, and Eastland is at 66%, and it dawned on me that I am a part of that 32.4%. And as much as I hated teaching at that moment, I still had to look at the data that I contributed to and figure out what can I do to become a better educator so I don't go in the classroom and just feel the body of the teacher, just to take up a paycheck. So what I did was, I made sure I met with my principal, Ms. Lynch. My, my administrator, y'all, she's about this tall. She hates standing this, literally. She's like this tall. But she has two master degrees, national board of education uh, certificate, and she's getting her doctorate while she's pregnant and she's engaged. She's like, a, she's like an educational uh, uh, Goku from uh, Dragon Ball Z or something. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. And she's very stoic, so she can tell you stuff about yourself, and she's not even smiling. She's like, let me change that lesson. <coughs> and then she walks off real quick. <laughs> but, I, but I met with her because I said, I need you to help me. Think about it. We should not wake up every day just to be average. We should actually wake up every day to be the best that we can be. If you're okay with waking up being average and not taking advantage of the opportunities that you've been blessed with, you need to change your mindset. I said, help me as an educator. Tell me what I need to do so I can be better. I remember sitting down with her who we were covering topics of guided reading, classroom management, differentiating your lessons with your students, really looking at your data and digging down to make sure that you're really addressing the needs that the children have. And it was a long meeting, but that meeting was beneficial. And it helped me. I played basketball at, at Western Salem State University. I was a guard. And what happens is, as a guard, you know, because the uh, March Madness just ended right then. I'm not a Tar Heel fan, but just shout out to them. And I remember, as a, if, when you play college athletics, there's something called a scouting report. And a scouting report lets you know about the individual you're about to face. So say we have the amazing dean here was on a scouting report. It would be, hey, he's a, a great shooter, uh, he, he, he works well with his teammates, but he's not great at defense. Me being the opposing player, I know all I got to do is go at him, and he's not going to be able to defend me well based on the scouting report. And as a teacher, I wanted to make sure when I brought up on the scouting report or the EVOS data is projected about me, that it's saying good things about me. I don't know why people are so scared of being told what you're doing wrong, but sometimes in life, as you mature as an educator, you have to be comfortable with constructive criticism because it's supposed to help you. You can't take offense to it. So at that point, in that low point in my life, when I was ready to quit, I had to be humble enough to receive all the information from my teacher and from my boss. And Lord knows she let me have it. She did let me have it. And this is my reaction at first. And honestly, this is. This is some teacher's response. This is something, you go inside a teacher classroom, you want to and tell her about how she's not differentiating her lesson. You ain't seen my key. It's a, you don't know what I teach with every day. And the second point to this, first you're supposed to reflect. The second is convert constructive criticism or negativity into fuel. People, like I said in the last point, they often get really offensive about being told you need to work on. And as I sit here and I look at it, it says, often people allow negativity to become a roadblock instead of using it for fuel to power forward. I think it's one of the unique things about me. You can say negative things and stuff about me, and all I want to do is, as I model for my kids, is change it to fuel to be better. For example, I've heard it all. When I first got to Pitt County, it was like, hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm a teacher. Oh, you coach PE? Why got to coach PE? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and then, or, I, I, more serious. I've heard one of the only, this comes from teachers too. The only reason why he went to Ellen because he's a black male working with black kids, or you just hear all types of stuff. And what I have found that you need to recognize and do is convert it into fuel. At that point in time, I was hearing those stereotypes. His kids are engaged, but are they really learning anything? That's what I was hearing at that point in time. So I took it to myself, okay, they're saying that. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get in a gossip battle with human adults. Okay, we're supposed to be adults here. I'm going to take what you're saying and I'm going to become better. And that's why I love that quote by Michelle Obama stating that when they go low, we definitely have to go high. And it pays off, as you can see from the Ellen stuff. If I would have responded to those comments, I'm quite sure I would have gotten into some type of dumb verbal battle with the teacher and lost that opportunity instead of working to be creative. This is my last point, but number three, as I close, and this is the most critical one for me. Anthony, this guy stepped here. <coughs> 